Your Excellency President Tsai, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the celebration of the 90th anniversary of Academia Zeneca. Please join me in welcoming the President of Academia Zeneca, Dr. James Liao. President Tsai, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Academia Sinica. Thank you so much for joining us in celebrating our 90th anniversary. Academia Sinica was established in 1928 when the ROC government was still in the mainland. Over the past nine decades, we have experienced all sorts of changes. Our main campus has 38 hectares of land. Okay. When we started in Taipei, it was only a few buildings after the Second World War. Now our main campus has 40 modern buildings. In addition, we have recently established the National Biotechnology Research Park, just right next to our campus. This National Biotechnology Research Park will house several organizations and will be the hub for biotechnology research and startup activities in Taiwan. We're also building our southern campus near the city of Tainan. And research at this campus will focus on three main areas. That is agricultural biotechnology, sustainability and circular economy, and Taiwanese culture and history. We currently have 31 research institutes and research centers organized into three divisions, math and physical sciences, life sciences, humanities and social sciences. We have close to 9,000 dedicated employees with 882 faculty members and about 100 research specialists. In addition, we are also training about 1,000 postdoctoral fellows and about 5,000 graduate students and research associates, research assistants. In addition, we have an honor society whose member we call academicians. We are proud to have a total of 289 academicians, including six Nobel laureates. We also have 14 honorary academicians. Among them, Dr. Dan Mode of NAE is with us today. Our missions are to advance research in the humanities and sciences, to promote and facilitate scholarly research, to cultivate outstanding academic talent. Apart from the goals mentioned above, we are dedicated to helping our nation to establish national research infrastructure. One example is the Taiwan Biobank, which is to collect 200,000 community biosamples and 100,000 hospital samples. We also established the Center for Digital Cultures to link open data and conduct innovative projects and stimulating other applications. In terms of social responsibilities and outreach, we regularly publish white papers containing policy recommendations and offer popular science platforms through social media and public seminars. During the past few decades, our academicians and researchers have contributed significantly to our society. For example, we helped set up arsenic standards to control Blackfoot disease. We also convinced the government to initiate a hepatitis B vaccination program, which greatly reduced the hepatitis B carrier rate and incidences of liver cancer. In 2003, we helped combat it 
the SARS epidemic in Taiwan. More recently, we made several important contributions. We identified genes associated with adverse drug effects in patients with Stevens-Johnson syndrome, while also designing an effective HIV vaccine and carbohydrate-based cancer vaccines. We determined the mechanisms of polar ozone depletion. Ozone depletion is believed to increase the risk of cancer and cause climate change. We have also made major achievements in astronomy. Academia Sinica is deeply involved in the Atacama Large Millimeter Array in Chile, which is called ELMA, the largest ground-based astronomical telescope on our planet. We also participated in the construction of the Greenland Telescope, which is part of the very long baseline interferometer. These effects help us determine and understand the formation and the fate of planets and stars. In the humanities and social sciences, we maintain our place at the forefront of sinological research. We have published a 10-volume series entitled New Perspectives on Chinese History and organized the fourth international conference on sinology in 2012. The results of that event spanned 22 edited volumes on topics treating new breakthroughs in the field of sinology. At one archaeological site near the southern city of Tainan, our researchers unearthed the remains of cultivated rice, showing that agriculture in Taiwan actually started at least 5,000 years ago. This one example of how our research has contributed to the understanding of nation's history. So we have accomplished a great deal and have continued to make major contributions in many areas. Moving forward, we will face the future with ambition, responsibility, and wisdom. We should aim at solving major problems in science and the humanities. Moreover, we should accept the responsibility to advise and reach out to the society. Finally, we should be wise enough to guide and execute plans effectively. We aspire to be a leader in our field for all the projects we undertake regardless of whether they involve curiosity-driven or mission-oriented research. Now, this slide is intentionally placed here to encourage people to think out of the box. We should reach the forefront of knowledge, like this person is sitting anxiously at the edge of science, contemplating on how to make the next big jump. We should explore the frontiers of science ambitiously and devise a way wisely to attain the next quantum level. Meanwhile, we should not be narrowly focused. We should be aware of major issues in different cultures and different parts of the world as we are living in a global community. So what are the major problems facing scholars in science and humanities? Here's a partial list. How to control climate change and how to achieve healthy longevity in the aging society. These are probably the world's most pressing needs. What is memory and what is consciousness? These represent two curiosity-driven problems, not just concerning how the brain works, but how society deals with collective memory and consciousness. How does life deal with stress? This problem probably resonates with everyone on Earth, 
ranging from biologists to economists. Finally, how does the past connect to the present and predict the future? This problem can be asked from the molecular level all the way to the vast universe. If we consider problems of this scale, our research project may take on a totally different meaning. In doing research, we should not forget our responsibilities. But to whom are we responsible? First, we should be responsible to the academic community, our peers. Our duty is to abide by scientific standards and maintain scientific integrity. Second, we need to be responsible to our society. Since we are publicly funded, we bear the tasks of providing information, inspiring action, and training new talent. Third, we live in a global community. Our research should benefit all humankind, not just ourselves. Most importantly, we should have the wisdom to select important problems that are suitable for us to work on and set up feasible plans to execute our research projects. We should focus on true values and real contributions instead of the number of published papers or impact factors. Finally, we should work both effectively and interactively. Interaction is essential for harnessing collective wisdom, as we all know. During the past few decades, the scientific community has evolved from a largely isolated ivory tower to one responding to calls from society with extensive collaboration. Our academy should also evolve from a conglomerate of institutes to an organization like a small orchestra of science, which composes music, motivates performers, and inspires different audiences using the sounds of science. In this orchestra, everyone plays different roles, and each player is self-motivated. As we journey into the future towards our centennial decade, we should bear in mind that it is our responsibility to pass the land to the next generation as we inherited it. We also have a duty to leave a legacy of knowledge for our children and future generations to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Zheng Liao.